reason why it is so famous is actually, if let's jump for a second into verse 3. So one of the seraphs called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Lord, he is the Lord of hosts, or Lord of armies, we'll talk about this. The whole earth is full of his glory. Does that by any chance sound familiar? It's on music. It's on music, and where do we sing that? Yes, every time we have communion, actually. Every time we have communion, the, uh, when, when I say it is good and right and salutary to have, and whatever the prayer is, you guys respond with a praise, sinful prayer, let's put it this way, made up out of two passages in the Bible. This is one of them. And then the second part is made out of passage of the triumphant entry of Jesus, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So that's what the second part is, you know, that when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, um, uh, we, we sing that. So every time we have communion, we remind ourselves that we are in the presence of God, similar to the presence that uh, Isaiah experienced. Okay? So two things about that. One is, how cool is that to be in the liturgical church? But the second thing is, our, our liturgy is not only set up in the biblical way, like if you want to go in the book of Leviticus, it tells you what kind of sacrifices you have, what kind of structure of the sacrifices. We do not do sacrifices because Christ sacrificed himself once and for all. Therefore, we do it in remembrance of his sacrifice. But, okay, in our liturgy, we are not only do it according to the Bible, but we also use the words of the Bible, okay? And I think it's great. It, it, it's a great blessing. Uh, so, like, for example, you know, uh, unlike in other churches where people sometimes get stuck with the sermon series of whatever pastor want to preach about. And recently I read a joke that, you know, as a Groundhog Day, you know that we recently had a Groundhog Day. So he looks back and sees the shadow. So if pastor turns around and sees his shadow, so you are stuck with six more weeks of his <laughs> sermon series. You know. Sorry, could not just could not you know yeah I, I need yeah because I'm so I with my so off-putting personality I have to say a joke from time to time. Uh, okay, so Isaiah six, uh, we are not going to go into uh, too much details of about the book of Isaiah. We've talked about this so many times. Just to remind you, there are those who believe that Isaiah is not written by one guy. It is written by other guys. I'm not going to waste time to explain why it's wrong. Okay? It's simply wrong. Okay? The book of Isaiah is written by one guy. His name is Isaiah. That's what Jesus knew. That's what other people knew. Until in the end of 18th century, some... Actually, sorry to say that German guys came up with the idea that they know Hebrew text better than anybody else before, and therefore they can see the stylistic differences. Okay? I don't know. I mean, it's like for me to discuss, you know, that uh, after a college class, let's say in Cuesta, uh, if I would be totally ESL. Uh, I am ASL, I have an ESL syndrome, but if I would be like really ASL, I would have one class in Cuesta and then discuss the differences between, I don't know, uh, um, Scott Fitzgerald and, uh, um, I don't know, Mark Twain or something, you know, it, it's, you know, what's the real linguistic differences, you know, and Mark Twain did not write his stuff by himself. It was a bunch of helpers, and we can see it based on stylistic differences. It's like it's about the same stuff, you know? So when, when Jesus is given the scroll of Isaiah, it says Isaiah, okay? And he reads from 61st chapter, close to the end. So one book. Now, with the text, because we, we have a rich text, and it's kind of important to cover most of the stuff. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. I was really hoping that the, actually Benny Laudermilk will be here because this is one of the passages where trains are in the Bible. You know, and him being a train engineer, I think he would really appreciate that stuff. But you know that this is not really <laughs> the train that, that he worked, I mean, all of his, basically, all of his adult life with. Uh, it, it, it's, a, you know, you can, I don't want to say scars, you know, that, that, that outside uh, corners of his robe. Now, above him stood the seraphim, okay, and it's good because sometimes you can see, not in the Bible, but in like a theological literature, you can see seraphims, okay? That's, that, that's kind of easy for me to explain. Um, so, seraphim, I, I've told you many times that this is plural ending, okay? So, if we want to make it English, more English-like, we can either leave it as seraphim or we can say seraphs, okay? Because that, that's a single thing, you know, seraph. So plural would be seraphs. Say sometimes when I see seraphims, it's like, you know, we have one dollar. It's one buck, okay? So a few bucks, okay? So seraphims would be like few boxes, okay? Same thing, same logic, okay? And it's very funny that in Russia that's how they say it. You know, they make bucks as singular, you know, one box, you know, and uh, then and the, then they add Russian plural ending to that. So it's, it's for those who are at least have English speakers, you know, it's, it's hilarious. But seriously, so I saw Seraphim, and what's going on? Each had six wings. With two, uh, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another. So it's. Uh, um, X number of them, we do not know how many, definitely plural, most likely more than, it's three or more, probably, I mean, my wild guess, just totally wild guess, would be four. Uh, because we see them kind of on the corners of the, uh, uh, of the throne room, so... And what they say is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, we'll stop for a second. The thing is, why is it so important that Isaiah sees God ruling from the throne? Because that's what people do when they sit on the throne. You know, it's a kind of king stuff. Why is this important in connection with the fact that King Uzziah died? Okay, now, I'm not going to draw the timeline today, but just for you to remember, uh, so 6 1 Uzziah. Okay, if you go to 2nd, sorry, 2nd, 2nd book of Chronicles. Chapter 26 talks about his rule. And the most important thing that you will find out from 2 Chronicle 26 concerning Uzziah, which is very relevant to our passage, is the fact that he ruled for 52 years. He was not 52 years old when he died. He ruled for 52 years. And he began, actually, his rule at age 16, so he was like, what, 68? But the point is, think about this. You know, in the United States, we do not think in those categories. That's probably one of the things that we can definitely, we are definitely unlike other nations, okay? We are somewhat separate. We did not want to do, have anything to do with the kingship or queenship or anything like that, okay? Therefore, we kind of like some of our presidents, and sometimes we do not like some of other presidents. But the worst case scenario, 
five, three, eight years, and it's somewhat over, okay? At least, even if it will be from the same party or from a different party, it's definitely gonna be a different person. So four years plus, maybe, four years, then definitely that's it, game over, okay? So in our mind, psychologically, we, can, we, we, we do not really even think in those matters. Nah, seriously, think about this. If the guy was ruling for 52 years, that means if you are, let's say just roughly, 60 years or younger, you do not know anybody. You do not, I mean, you do not know anybody else who ruled the country, okay? And even if you are a little bit older, first of all, there would be no many people, not so many people that would be older than 60 years. Because with their medicine and with their regularity to get into the war, I mean, you kind of lose population relatively quickly, okay? But even those who would be above the mark of 60 years, still, uh, that's the, with 52 years of rule, that's the majority of life. I mean, like, majority, majority. I mean, to be able to compare the rule with someone else, you need to be like, I don't know, 90? To have at least some memories that you were like 30 years old, 35 years old, and then that guy came, and now you see how country develops. So, from many angles, from psychological angle, from political angle, even from spiritual angle, because king is responsible for maintaining the temple in, in the Bible. So from many angles, we have a crisis. The king is gone. What is going to happen now? You know, uh, it's not like that in UK, because they have a parliament, they have the election of prime ministers, and so on and so forth. But I bet, I can bet money Many people will go emotionally and psychologically into crisis when King Elizabeth will die. Oh, yeah. Frantic. You know, probably if they will not skip somehow, if, if the parliament will not come up with a, some kind of sneaky idea, and it will really go to her son, I'm really... I'm really sorry for the guy. <laughs> I mean, seriously, he's been waiting for the throne forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. Okay. And ever, you know. So even if he will rule, he probably will rule for, I don't know. A few years. Few, exactly. <laughs> Let's be polite. Few years, you know. Get rid of him. You know, so, uh, okay. But my point is, she is ruling... He, she is in the status of Her Majesty for what, like 50 some years? 70? Yeah, you're behind. Of rule. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 because she's like, what, 90 something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just, so when, when this will happen, I mean, it will happen. I mean, so far, nobody skipped that thing, you know, everybody dies. So, the thing is, when it will happen, it's going to be a crisis in the UK. I mean, I, I seriously, I can bet money on that. So we have a similar story here. Therefore, what we read in verse 3 and the fact that he, the Lord, is on his throne is reassurance that kings actually come and go. I mean, however, I don't know, mean and sarcastic that might sound, but they actually do come and go. But he is the king forever. He rules forever. He rules all of the time. Actually, he uses those kings as his agents to rule. Okay? And I think it is important for us, because sometimes we as Christians, and I would say especially here in the U.S., you know, we, we, we get too separated. You know, we have a spiritual realm, and we have our social or political realm. And again, I'm not going to tell you what, what is a good present, what is, but my point is, you know, we need to understand that even if we like the president or even if we do not like the president, we have the one whom we confess every Sunday 
sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father. Okay? That's it. That's, that's the real thing that I need to, as a pastor, help you to understand. Whatever happens, and it doesn't mean that that means we have to like what happens, but we need to see, uh, try to see uh, uh, how the rule of Christ is implemented on earth. And therefore, we can have our evaluations of our leaders based on the will of God on one hand and how it is implemented on earth. You know, I'm not about the building of the kingdom necessarily as in the sense what Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching about. But <coughs> we need to see how they portray the one who is ruling from the throne right uh, from the right hand of the Father. Now, we spent too much time for this kind of introduction. So now, yep. <laughs> seraphs. Uh, so we're probably not going to get into all the verses. But it, it's kind of cool. So seraph from Hebrew means actually fiery one. Okay? If you want to go back to Numbers 21, go home and reread the story. It's a story which sometimes is translated as a bronze snake. Okay? It was not actually bronze. It's, it's I mean, at the end of the story, Moses makes a banner with probably a copper wire running through uh, to symbolize the bronze snake. But in reality, the word seraph means fiery one. Uh, how would I spell fiery? Fiery like that? That's good. Good enough? I'm all E-Y. E-Y? That's what I thought. For some reason, I, I don't know. I-R-Y. 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 That's what, so F I E. Oh, E. Really? Yep. Good eraser. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Always learn something new. So the cool thing is so it's a fiery one. With wings. We're coming to there, okay? And it's very often connected with the word which means snake, though seraph is not the word for a snake itself. Okay, in 21, it's actually, they had snakes, fiery ones, so you have to make an image of the fiery snake, therefore they end up with the bronze serpent. Okay, so now think about this. What image it will come into your mind if I will say something like a snake with wings, fire breathing? Dragon. Dragon. Okay? So I know for us it's like dragons. It's like either from uh, medieval, you know, fairy tale stories or from Chinese culture. I don't know. It's right here. You know, and it's very interesting. We actually have a repetition of the same idea in Isaiah 14, again, at the very end of the chapter. So. He is surrounded with some kind of very interesting creatures that we are not seeing every day. So those guys are glorifying him and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And we talked about this. this the host is not necessarily the number. It's not about, it's, it's not only about the number. Okay? So it's the Lord of armies. Okay? And the whole earth is full of his glory. So he is not only in heaven, the whole earth is full of his glory here. Okay, the foundations of the, verse 4, foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, that kind of gives you an idea where everything happens. Where is the throne room of God, if we think about earth? On Church. earth. Uh, let, let, let's go into biblical times. Close enough, but let's go into biblical. See, that's the, that's the thing. You know, people read the Bible and they immediately jump into the church time. Okay, before the church time, if we'll go into times of Isaiah, where we can think of a place, what, what place we can think of to be a throne room of God? Holy 
Holy. Holy of Holies. Holy. Okay? Now, so let me draw it. Okay. That should be square. So that's the temple, that's the holy of holies, that's the holy place. Okay? What we have here is the Ark of the Covenant with actually wings. four cherubims here with wings stretched forward and backwards. Now, how do you enter? So there is a veil here. What is in front of the veil? Okay, two things. To read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And actually, the deeper in Revelation you go, the more you need to know about this stuff. If you do not know the structure of the sanctuary, it's, you will end up with weird ideas while you read the Revelation. So, in the holy place, what do we have? We have three things. We have a table. With twelve breads. Okay? Who do those twelve breads represent? The tribes. The tribes of Israel. Cool. Now we also have a bishop-like figure, because bishop means episcopos is the one who oversees. So we have a lamp stand that is right across from the table. And it oversees the, the table with the showbread, okay, or with the face bread. That lampstand is never fully quenched. So even if you have to fix one of the lamps, okay, you take it, you, you know, quench it, you know, tip it, you know, fix the whatever the thing, you know, put more oil or whatever. Six other ones are still burning. So that's what constantly overseeing Israel. So in one of our Psalms, I think it's Psalm 122, I believe, or 21. No, let me give, give me a second. 121. Okay? He will not let your food be uh, moved, so he keeps you. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Okay? So we usually think about, and especially it begins, I lift up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. And usually you see like, you know, if it's on a postcard, some kind of mountains, you know, we can have our bishop speak or whatever thing. No. The mountain that help comes from is actually... The altar that you have, because it has four peaks. Altar that you sacrifice for your sins, and that's going to be important for our story. The altar that we have here. And this altar is altar of incense. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when in Isaiah 6 it says, the whole house was filled with smoke. Okay? That comes from here. Oh. Okay? So to see all of that, to see these, and to see the feeling of smoke, where Isaiah has to be, like somewhere right here. Okay, he is the priest. He is inside. He is not inside of the holy of holies, but the veil, veil is open, and he sees that stuff. So he is here, probably. I don't know. I hope I can draw it somewhat carefully. Pray. And why he's praying? Because he has a problem. Big, big problem. His problem is, woe to me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. Okay, not mouth, lips. It's important. Give me a second. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. Okay, remember, king died 
but the real king rules forever. So I see, I, my eyes have seen the real guy, the real guy who rules, uh, the Lord of Armies. So what's the problem with lips? Okay, the lips are in the Bible is are for worship. Okay, Lord, open up my eyes. No, lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Okay, Psalm fifty one. Uh, something like fifteen or sixteen. Fifty one. The Psalm of David. The uh, the. Fifteen, yeah, fifteen, and my mouth will declare your praise. Okay. Yeah, it's easy to remember. Fifty-one, fifteen. Cool. So that's how our evening worship service begins. You know, you can open up any uh, Lutheran service books and open Vespers, and that's the first phrase: "Lord, open up my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise." So the thing is, what he says is, people do not know how to worship, and I am in the presence of God. So. That's a problem. But that problem is solved by God himself as usual. You know, people get themselves in, into the problems and God graciously solves the problems. Because one of those guys takes the tongs from the altar. Now, if he is here, what kind of altar, what kind of coil is used? From here or from here? Okay, from this one, from the smoke. Because first of all, it's closer. But then there is another deeper meaning. He is able, after the coil is touched his lips, he is cleaned, and therefore uh, your guilt is taken away, and your sins are known for. So uh, he, when, when Isaiah hears the voice, he says, who, when, when he hears, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? He says, I am. Okay? So this altar represents the prayers of Israel, okay? So now he can go into prayerly life, into uh, fellowship with God life, and therefore he can be uh, God's representative, okay? Now, we have a second part of this chapter uh, that I will go really, really, really fast. Two things. Thing number one is actually verses from 9... 9 and 10 are used both in Matthew and in John to explain the dullness uh, of people's minds, hearts, or however you want to say that. You know, in the Bible, it, it's not very clear. We do not have a very clear distinction between heart and mind. You know, we usually think that heart is, you know, that's where butterf butterflies are. You know, that's where our emotions are. No, not really. Uh, mostly, we have few things. We, we do have emotions, uh, but we also have a mind. And however you make your decision, the decision comes from heart. Okay? So, if you do it based on your mind, fully, logically, you know, like a lawyer, uh, or... You do it like me, like a, like a pastor who wants to embrace everybody. No brain, no pain, you know. So something like that. Doesn't matter in the Bible. However you make your decision, that, that comes from heart, okay? Or most likely what happens is, is actually you do the, your decision based on the somewhat combination of both. A little bit of brain, in my case, you know, a little bit more brain in, you know, in Mel's case, you know, and, and things like that. So, um, that, that's the heart. So, he, when, when Jesus tells them that they do not understand his parables, they do not understand his praise, because, and then he quotes from Isaiah 6, that's what he refers to. The people are dull with their hearts, with, uh, they, they, they see, and they cannot perceive. They hear, but they still don't understand. It's kind of like off, is because... We see that Isaiah is in the midst of people who do not have uh, clean lips. Okay, again, they do not know how, they not know mentally, they do not know, but they do not have, 
a regular experience of how to properly worship, how to worship properly. Sorry, let's put it this way. Okay. Now, in the verse 11, Isaiah says, "So how long is going to take to heal all of that?" And then God tells him that everything is going to be ruined. But at the very end, the seed will be the stump. Even though everything is going to be, the trees are going to be cut off. And even the stumps are going to be burnt. But their seed is going to be the real stump. Okay? So, again, we are not going to go into timeline. But it is important to understand that Isaiah is roughly, so, let's get, let's kind of scrap it, you know. Uh, Uzziah died in 740 BC. The temple is destroyed in 586 BC. So we have about 150 years in between, roughly. Okay? 150 years before the exile, God tells Isaiah that people will end up in exile. Okay? He told them many times. Isaiah, then in Jeremiah, many, many minor prophets, but they have been warned, you know. So, it's a very important passage for our achievements, or not achievements, for our attempts. That, that's a better word, sorry. In our attempts to do, I don't know, evangelism, outreach, however you want to call it. Because when people say, why God did it to me? <sighs> Sometimes you might want to look back. And maybe God had warned you, most likely more than once, that if you're not going to stop what you're doing, you're going to end up in a very destructive situation. But the cool thing is, and I need to uh, summarize everything and stop by this, this very last phrase. The Holy Seed is at stop. So that, that actually, uh, people of Isaiah time and people of Jesus time, and even people in the church today, needs to understand that we do not stand on our own. Okay, it's not because it's many of us. Uh, people are tithing. We are financially somewhat okay. That that, that means the church will stay forever. Uh, it will stay for a while, but. We need to understand that at the root of everything, that the thing that holds things, and therefore even has enough power to give uh, living sources in case the resurrection is needed, is the holy seed, okay? Singular, not offspring, like in some of your translations uh, or footnote. It, it's not about the offspring, it's about the seed, okay? And with this, we need to go back, very, very back, to Abraham. So the promise is given to Abraham and his seed. And that's what St. Paul builds in third and fourth chapters of Galatians. Okay? And we have the revelation of this seed. We just celebrated it during Christmas. So that seed came manifested as Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's the thing that holds everything together, okay? It's good to have a great number of people. It's good to be financially somewhat independent church. But all of that is the stuff that kind of reflects the glory uh, that is, you know, in, in, in his rule. In the rule of him being at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, he is the king forever, okay? Questions or comments?